racism always points out my people as being weak people, as being less than, and then bringing their rules and their religion and their languages and their cultures and imposing them on us. And then I'm fourth generation of residential school experience. I'm fourth generation. Did you know that I couldn't even tell my own parents my experience? And I can't any longer because they're gone. And you know what racism does? Racism stirs up your life 30 years down the road and they call it um, residential school survivor, residential school victim, like it was my fault that I did this to myself that my parents did that to themselves, that my grandparents did that to themselves, that my great-grandparent was brought to Calgary here to the industrial school and given a whole different name that wasn't even his name because the people didn't understand the language and the dialect that he came from. So they changed his whole being and it took my generation to lift that secret up and acknowledge that. No wonder we feel displaced, and racism does that. I've heard stories from friends and families, and I mean, I've had a couple episodes as well where I've been treated differently just because of the color of my skin. People discriminate based on race all the time. I think it's a kind of natural thing to do in a lot of ways. Something to overcome consciously. We only accumulate only what is allowed. So it's, 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 the racism exists in which it only allows you to achieve, uh, I mean, to achieve a certain um, consistency in life, and you cannot rise above, above. In the workplace, it exists in one aspect. Uh, it exists in day-to-day -day life, um, just from getting a coffee, you know. Um, I think it even exists standing at the train station and how people socially interact with one another, um, who you stand beside, who you close proximity to, who you decide to share your feelings with. I, I think everyone is racist to a certain degree just because humans are lazy people and it's a very easy way to categorize the people around us without us having to think too much about it. You just break it down based on what you see in the first couple seconds. So yeah, I would say everyone does it. Like, I mean, even when I'm just on Facebook, I see people say stuff that I'm like, I can't believe that you would say that about anybody. Even now, like, I don't know, people just, they're so racist for some reason, I just don't get it. Like, it's not really as visible as it was before, it's just kind of discreet, you know? Like, kind of just hidden, but it's still there. Inarguably, I don't understand how anybody could we live in our society and not think that racism exists. Like, it's, it's almost everywhere. It happens all the time. You, you can see it just by the way people act. And it's sort of just in the fact that people are different, and a lot of people just don't like that they're different. It's really weird and confusing. I wish I understood more of how it worked, but I don't. Sometimes we need other people who look like us to tell us how it is, so if that makes sense, that's good. Racism is a word that we use to describe how power and resources and privilege are dispersed within a society um, in relation to someone's ethnic background. So in Canada and in most parts of the world, we can't talk about racism without talking about white privilege. And white privilege is um, how, as a white person, I have numerous benefits that privilege me and my position and my opportunities within society. We're not going to stand by here anymore watching, turning a blind eye to the inhumane acts of tyranny and violence anymore. So we're going to come together here as artists, but more importantly as human beings. We're going to put our hands up and we're going to proclaim our stance and our unity with those that are demanding change through our, our form of dance. So we're really dedicating this piece to Michael Brown and Eric Garner and any of those who have fallen victims to this broken system. I grew up in a multicultural community in Calgary and moved to a rural area 
area where racism is still very prevalent. And it's issues in our society like this that haven't been addressed. They're still there. We need to raise awareness about these issues. And that's what this dance is about, both raising awareness for Eric Gardner in Staten Island, as well as racism in our local communities and the surrounding areas. racism in sort of two ways. Um, one is interpersonal or intersubjective forms of racism. So those are things like comments or um, things that are said to people, uh, interactions between two people uh, about race uh, or a discriminatory comment, discrimination of a sort of um, personal nature. And I think that that's a very profound form of racism that you know has profound impacts on people's lives. Um, but I also like to think about racism in terms of the structural implications of racism and the way that race is uh, structured through um, all of our social institutions. So um, our economy, social policy, um, things like policing, social services, the education system. Um, and I think that, that thinking about it in that way, in that structural way, allows us to see the profound uh, impacts of racism and race in our everyday lives. Um, happened in grade seven or eight. Um, I was after school working on something in the art room. And um, these two boys who were in my class um, managed to somehow lock me into this art room and let off a stink bomb um, and as they were like exiting because I was not really sure what was happening um, they started telling me about how the stink bomb smell smelt like me which was to them smelt like curry so they were like haha this smells like you you packy like you know and it was just it was um really terrible because first of all I was like I don't smell like this I don't smell like rotten eggs um, and how do you even know what I smell like but anyway so um that was my experience with racism um what ended up happening was I went home told my parents uh they ended up speaking with the principal of the school um and I guess the boys were reprimanded I'm not too sure because I kind of just saw them back in my classes so I grew up uh, at the edges of the city and um, experienced different forms of uh, uh, things that made me uncomfortable um, you know, the, the name calling Packy, those kinds of things, um, because of where I resided. Uh, I was one of the very few minorities at my school, and I knew I always stood out, but I didn't really understand what it all meant. Um, and, and I just thought it was uh, something that I had to just accept and deal with. I remember one time when I was in grade 10 or 11, and my best friend in high school she was white and she had invited me to her house and I went there she invited me and our other best friend who is also Caucasian we went to to her house in Rundle and it was it was really nice they had a barbecue they were in the backyard um, she seemed like she had this perfect family I remember sitting at the table in the backyard eating with them and I remember feeling that her parents did not want me there. I hadn't done anything. I was in my best behavior. I just remember them talking to her and my other friend and ignoring me. That's where I ex feel I experienced racism is being left out or ignored or not wanted. And it was these, these kids in eighth grade that, it's two kids, it's two boys who were in all my classes that would sit there and pick on me and call me racial slurs. And that's when I got introduced to racial slurs, chug, wagon burner, all that fun stuff. And, you know, social studies was a real treat because that's when you start to learn about, you know, uh, natives and all that stuff. And they start, get, start to get more in depth about the assimilation of natives. And that was just a treat, getting called a chug every day in social class. And, you know, and you brush it off your shoulder. And, and it's weird because the teachers never stepped in. They were never like, hey, does that bother you? There was one time closer to the end of the year that the teacher was like, you know, I noticed that these guys are picking on you. Are they bothering you? And it was just to the point that I was like, I didn't want to make a big stink out of it. So I was like, no, I'm fine. 
I know they're kidding, but they weren't kidding. They were, you know, they really terrorized me. And it got, it got to the point in my teenage years that I was too ashamed to admit that I was Native. When I first got into grade four, um, I definitely started, um, I had issues with bullying and a little bit of racism. Because, um, you know, I, was, I wasn't of complete white background. I, you know, I'm half black. And I found that, uh, you know, I definitely stood out. And I was, I guess you could say, targeted a bit. You know, I wasn't only the new kid, but I was just very different. I wasn't from around here. And it um, seemed like that was uh, enough of a reason to get singled out. And, um, you know, like I definitely had to learn the hard way as to how to stand up for myself, kind of defend myself. And, you know, I'm not proud of it, but I definitely, you know, got into scraps here and there just to, just to, you know, not let the bullying get too, too far. Because I was always kind of by myself and I didn't have any other way out. It was either, you know, take the ridicule or, or maybe I, you know, throw my weight around a little bit and, and defend myself. Racism has always been an issue for me, um, especially when I was growing up in elementary school. It was really difficult to say the least because I was trying to make friends and fit in and um, there was always this group of girls that would be very nasty towards me. Uh, they would tell me and this other East Indian, East Indian girl that we're not beautiful. Um, they would intentionally shun us out, um, not let us, you know, partake in whatever games they're playing and really hurt my feelings. Um, and it wasn't until I was older, like, you know, 12, uh, so a few years older that I started to realize that, you know, it's okay to be different and that it's not my fault that these girls are treating me that way. What people run into, and far too often, is just this these um, interpersonal um, racist slurs. So when the Jewish kids basketball team plays a game, some of the other teams throw pennies at them because Jews are supposedly cheap. When um, people work in construction or in uh, restaurants or you know, uh, manual labor kind of jobs, usually, but not always, there's, they're subjected to Jewish jokes all the time and that are supposed to be funny, but it's not funny. And, and just people say things that are just inappropriate and unkind. And that kind of thing happens way too often. When I was working at that one location downtown, that boutique, um, I had a customer. She was this older white lady, and she walked in, and she seemed kind of almost disgusted of me. And so I gave her her space. I figured maybe she has a problem with me, and maybe she wants her space. Could have been having a bad day. We're taught not to know what they're thinking and she bought something and after she bought something she was discussing with me that she was going on a trip to Italy. I told her I always wanted to go to Italy, one day I'll go and then she said save your pennies nigger and walked out. I've been discriminated a few times. A little while ago I started wearing the, um, the hijab, like the scarf on my head and I went to school with it and um, I felt like people were treating me differently, like my peers and my teachers. They would judge me for it. Not only would they say it to my face, but they would say things behind my back. And ever since then, I haven't been comfortable wearing it again because I just didn't want to go through it. Uh, so I just recently moved here. I uh, moved in September. Um, like most folks, it's the story is to work. Um, and in my time here, in the few months, I've had a number of uh, egregiously racist, but also a lot of passive aggressive, micro aggressive um, experiences. I've been called the N words a number of times. Um, I've had people uh, look at me very strangely when I go into stores. I've had people lock the doors when I walk past their cars. Um, I've had the experience of feeling like the black man in this particular city, and ever since I've moved here, it is something that's continually, continually, continually facing. I can honestly say that in the 14 years I've lived here, yeah, no, I have never, I've never experienced racism. Um, you know, as a white Anglo-Celtic male, I have never experienced racism. Um, I've seen examples of it, and I know that people who are visibly Muslim have told me, and these, you know, exclusively women have told me about incidents that they've 
experienced where they've been harassed on the street, where somebody has shouted something at them from a passing car, or people have stalked them and said, you know, you're a terrorist and things like that. I personally have never experienced anything, um, any, anything racist. Um, I think I have experienced, on the other hand, instances where um, when, when meeting some First Nations people, like they're very, they're very wary of me and very suspicious of me until they get to know me, and I think that's probably a reflection of, of their own, you know, unfortunate experiences with with racism on on a daily basis. I'm, I'm told by First Nations friends that they experience racism on a daily basis, whether it's you know low levels of harassment or just you know stares and rude, rude looks and comments. So I was born and raised in Calgary and it's interesting, I've always loved living here because people are so friendly and um, I felt very comfortable until recently where there's a, a bigger media focus on Muslims and how we're, something's wrong and uh, I've never felt there was racism around even though being involved in campaigns that are anti-racism, anti-prejudice. And recently, uh, I was in public space, common area, and someone had said to me, you know, you should go back to where you came from. And at first, it was a joke. Like, I thought it was a joke, so I said, you know, we're all from somewhere. Where are you from? Um, being born and raised here in Peter Lougheed Hospital, I really didn't think anything of it. And then they, in a circular motion, around my scarf, around my hijab, they said, you know, you should take that off. Um, made references that it was a towel. And I had, I don't remember how the conversation ended, but I had left feeling, why would someone say something like that? When it comes to um, the, the Sudanese community, we have been actually denying to rent the places. So if, if you are a Sudanese and you want to, to have a, a party or far raising, because most of the time we want to far raise the money to support the, the, the community. So we are actually denied to rent the places. So that really tells a lot, like what they think that the, the, South, the, the, South, the Sudanese or South Sudanese people are very violent. My background is education. I've been teaching uh, in a college uh, level in Southeast Asia and Middle East for 15 years. And uh, I came to Canada a few years back. And I have got uh, a teacher license from Ontario College of Teachers. Then I didn't find a job and then I came to Calgary. And I'm driving a cab because I could not get back into my profession. But what I feel that in cab driving, uh, on daily basis, we face racism, verbal racism uh, by the Calgarians. Uh, not all of uh, them are uh, uh, like this, but, you know, uh, mostly they have the mind that the cab drivers are probably uneducated, ignorant people and they can say whatever they like and they can do whatever they feel and uh, few people realize that those people who are driving a cab may be educated people maybe they have a good profession maybe they have spent a better life so they came here for the name of uh, multiculturalism and the mosaic culture which canada claims in the world and it is uh, i love canada due to this uh, opportunity and that's why I'm here but uh, people don't realize uh, what's uh, going on with the cab drivers here. She once came to me and she said oh my dear you are oppressed I said who told you that I'm oppressed <laughs> I don't have any problem she said yeah you are totally covered so it means you are oppressed so she is she was uh, judging me without any knowledge just because she saw me covered she thought I am oppressed. I told her, no, I don't have any problem with my family or my husband or my, like, it's my own choice. And I'm very proud of my naqab. Um, she said, yeah, because when you are beautiful, you have to be uncovered. I said, no. I, 
for myself, I, I don't want to share my beauty with the public. It's for me, my family, my husband, and that's it. So, you know, the, the point here is don't judge anyone without asking. Like you have to ask, you have to talk, we have, we have to, to, to have some kind of um, conversation and then judging, uh, not just giving uh, judgment without any knowledge. And um, uh, covering your face or covering your head or wearing hijab, wearing niqab, doesn't mean that you are oppressed or you have problems. No, not at all. It's your choice. And uh, I have to respect uh, everybody's choice. Like if somebody um, uh, has uh, didn't cover, so it's her choice. She is free to cover or uncover. For myself, I, I want to cover, so I am free to cover. I basically left my cart at one of the aisles and I, was, I went and checked out a few, few other stuff in, in a different aisle. So I, I noticed that you know, somebody was actually um, taking stuff out of my cart. And uh, when I noticed that, I went into a uh, conversation with them and that conversation led to a racial slurs. So basically, uh, they were attacking me personally by the look of my face and saying, uh, you know, I... It, the country doesn't belong to me and uh, where I'm coming from and I should go back where I came from. So those kind of stuff and uh, did literally make me happy. So I um, engaged into more conversation with them and I said, let's go to the securities, let's check with them. Um, but uh, they started more, being more aggressive to me and uh, personally coming to me as if they wanted to pick up a fight. Um, so at that t particular time, one uh, really bizarre thing that happened, and I, I must mention that, is a lady came out and um, she was she wanted to help me out and she said guys this is not nice this is not who we are this is not what Canada is all about and that was very powerful that was very powerful and that was a lesson for myself and also for the all Canadian that when you see things such things happening in our society um, there is no, no room for this kind of stuff in our society we all should stand together regardless of our race religion creed nationalities uh, regardless of our background, we should all come together and face those people and let them let them know that this is this is Canada, this is a multicultural country, and um, you know anything, any racial things like that should be stopped. So I, I really appreciate what the lady did. Uh, she was very brave. She came out. She stood beside me, and she became my witness for the whole whole situation. Yeah, I looked at uh, racist tweets stemming from six different Canadian cities and Calgary was one of the cities and the purpose behind this was I wanted to get a sense of how are people using racist language on Twitter specifically. Uh, Twitter allowed me to search uh, by geocode so you could get tweets coming from certain cities and I search for key racist terms that are most commonly used connected to certain uh, demographics. What I found most interesting though uh, for Calgary but even just in general was just the the rawness of some of the, the statements, some of the tweets people were making. And it's one of those things where usually if someone would have like a racist thought, they might just leave it in their mind. But now with Twitter, they were tweeting it out, of course. And I think it was showcasing a little bit of a blurred boundaries around what Twitter actually is. Some people still feel that it's, you know, your own personal thoughts that you're saying behind your own personal account, which, which is fair. But at the same time, Twitter is a public sphere, right? It's something where once you tweet something out, once you say something, it does go out to potentially almost everyone. I mean, even in their terms of reference, they say, be careful what you tweet about because this could have the potential to reach a worldwide audience. So it was interesting under that context when people would be tweeting very, very hateful things. So one example that comes to mind was, you know, someone was about to board a, a plane and they would say, you know, the tweet specific was, oh great, I'm stuck beside a lard ass and and uh, a packy hashtag hashtag thanks and I found that to be interesting because usually you would have left that maybe in your mind uh, keep your racist thoughts to yourself but now that you're tweeting it it's more public it's more open and I think that shows a little bit of a blurred boundaries behind how people understand the medium as being private and not really understanding how public it actually is oh. it's just not about when people are raised it also comes from people are even unaware of it that they're like that. They think they're fine, they're not racist, but actually there are some small things that they won't be aware of that they're doing that are. Sometimes the meanest and the cruelest is what it, I, I call systemic racism. And that's when people are actually being racist to you 
and then they come off so naive when you ask them about their behavior. What? I'm not racist. That's, that is just the worst because it takes, it so disempowers you to even find the words to describe the feeling that you're experiencing. And as a child, you don't have words to put to use to describe how you're feeling. You learn that it's a bad feeling and you stuff it away and you make excuses for the people that are doing this to you because sometimes they're people that you love or people that come off saying that they do love you and they do care for you and it's for your best interest. Racism here in Calgary is there at a certain level. Uh, that is, uh, as I have a uh, turban, hair, black skin, and English uh, accent, what I can't uh, pronounce like uh, uh, white people, uh, I experienced uh, uh, that racism is there many times while getting job. Uh, I'm not preferred that much as uh, white people, and even uh, on job, uh, more preference is given to white people, or even if I have more uh, more educational qualification, I experience uh, racism. I noticed that whenever we post an ad for some open positions, uh, there are quite a lot of applicants from the, uh, emig they are immigrants. And uh, I talked to a lot of recruiters. They, the first thing they look at their resume is their last names. So they immediately find out that they are immigrants and they are very hesitant to interview them. This is the first thing. And then um, I would say because they focus too much on Canadian experience, because of that they unintentionally or unconsciously uh, overlook the experience they got from other countries. So a lot of their skills or experience or you know, ability uh, were ignored. So that's why a lot of people, they, even they have a very, very good experience uh, professionals and um, their ability or skills could be transferred to here but uh, they couldn't find any jobs here that is, that is the first problem the second uh, example I think I could think of is um, quite a lot of immigrants are working in our companies uh, my current companies or uh, in the companies that I worked for before and uh, a lot of uh, colleagues they were they like uh, joking about uh, different cultures or uh, some joking about their uh, races or uh, their culture. So uh, they would think it's very normal or when I was talking to them, I said to them, it's not very right for you to say that. But they would say it's very normal and it's, they're, jo they're just joking. So they don't know their, uh, what they said would hurt a lot of people. I was lucky enough to meet my high school sweetheart, uh, Prince is what his name is, he's Filipino, and when my family found that out, they were really kind of distraught because to them, an immigrant would be someone who's only with you for money, and so that's immediately what they thought when I brought him home. They're like, oh, he's only for the money, you gotta, you gotta let him go, go for someone else. I have uh, recently gotten to know a lawyer, an indigenous lawyer. She came out of the courtroom in her full gar uh, garb that they have to wear when they're presenting and uh, was, uh, you know, catcalled and asked how much and all sorts of things. She's visibly native. And uh, here, here's a professional legal woman being catcalled on the streets. Uh, this is a common occurrence for many Indigenous women to be um, solicited with the, the assumption we're somehow for sale. And he's like, you know, you're really exotic looking. You're so beautiful. What are you? So I was like, you know, I'm going off, blah, 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 blah. And I mentioned Native, and he takes a step back. He's like, you're a dirty little fucking Indian. And I was like, what the heck is wrong with you? And I went to go walk away, and he, like, grabbed my arm, and he was being aggressive towards me. He got kicked out, but, like you're hating me because I'm native, but yet two seconds ago you were like, wow, you're so exotic looking, you're so beautiful. But the minute you heard native, you were like, oh my God, something snapped in your mind. You you, you are racist, you have something against natives. And he got really aggressive with me and it was just awful, you know? And you know, you, you see and hear of those things every day in the world. And like, why are you, why are you being aggressive towards people 
because of their genetics. But we're so used to and, and protected um, by our privilege about not having to have those conversations that when we're confronted with either our own white privilege or with racism still even existing in the world, um, people who, are, who have white fragility tend to react in two ways. One is with anger, sort of explosive racism doesn't happen anymore, affirmative action is taking away jobs from white people, really going to an extreme um, angry reaction based on feeling threatened in, in our white privilege. And the other is being very defensive. So saying things like, um, uh, look, I, I'm not racist. I have all kinds of, of black friends and I have um, a native partner and, and trying to defend um, our own privilege by offering examples that are not really relevant to, to whether or not we're racist at all. So the white fragility piece is really about how uh, fragile white folks are to even talking about or being confronted with racism. You feel like you're constantly being watched. If something goes missing, if the counts go wrong, if someone count the, count, counted yeah. the cigarettes wrong, yeah. they'll look at you for still look at, they'll look at the immigrants first. There was, yeah. It was me and another Ethiopian guy. And it was constantly like, did you count that right? Did you do that right? And it's yeah. like, okay. You know what too? And, and they make you feel, sometimes I feel guilty for like, oh my God, like, am I pulling the black card? Am I pulling the race card? Am I just being, am I crazy? And then I realize like, these are the same people on your lunch, on, during your lunch breaks or during like a Christmas party when someone decides to have too much to drink will randomly tell a black joke. Mm -hmm. And then that's when, you, and you really feel like all this time I'm not paranoid. Yeah. All this time it's not coming from nowhere, you know? Most of the time when we face racism, um, a lot of time it's subtle and a lot of time it's not subtle. Uh, so when it happens and when we try to share it with other white folks, they're always like, oh, it's just one incident, it was just one person who did it, oh, you're too sensitive, all these things come up. Um, but when you are sharing with another person of color who has shared experience, they're like, yeah, that's racism, that's very important to address and you have the valid reason to be upset about that. The crappy thing about microaggressions is that when they happen, you question yourself, well, like, did that just happen? Like, did that store clerk really look at me weirdly but not look at the rest of the white clients? Did that, you know, when the door was locked, was that an accident or was that actually purposeful? So part of it is that it's so tricky to call out microaggressions and passive racism because it's so embedded and it's so, um, it's so everyday. Um, and because it's so everyday, it's so hard to call out, right? Um, in the cases where I've been called the N-word, I've, you know, I've, I've retaliated back and I've stated my opinions and left. But there was also one incident where I was by myself being on the train and it was late at night and I really didn't feel safe to, to say it because I didn't know what could happen, right? So I think the reality of being black and the reality of being racialized in a city like this is that um, you don't always have the ability to call it out and you don't always have the resources to be able to call it out. Canada is a settler colonial society, right? Like if it wasn't for the dispossession and expropriation of First Nations peoples, um, Métis peoples, all Aboriginal peoples, Canada wouldn't exist. Um, so racism is, is a part of the very foundation of this country, right? Taking land, breaking treaties, and I mean, as you know, the people who are um, face the most oppression in Canadian society today are Aboriginal people. So that's, that's there. Uh, second of all, it's how race has been constructed and understood. Um, Eastern, European people, Eastern European people originally, uh, before World War I, weren't considered white people um, in this country, right? So if you're Ukrainian, uh, Russian, uh, Czechoslovakian, you weren't considered white. And at that time, white meant being British, English, you know, essentially Anglo. Over time, the definition of whiteness expanded to... to uh, to uh, accept them, but a lot of people don't realize that the Ku Klux Klan had um, chapters here in Alberta and Saskatchewan uh, throughout the 20s and into the 30s. So I mean, the, the roots of hatred have been here for a very, very long time. It's embedded into the very structures. And I mean, we can also look at the ongoing fact that immigration to Canada doesn't take place because this country believes in helping people. Immigrants are generally allowed in because um, labor needs. So there's not even like really, you know, Let's allow people to come in and build this diversified. It's like we are bringing you because we need you to use your labor to make wealth. So. As a white person, you can experience discrimination and you can experience oppression and be white. 
but the important distinction is that you're likely not going to experience discrimination and experience oppression because you're white. And that's sort of the difference um, for me, the way that I think about how white privilege is so powerful and prevalent. Um, and one of the ways that it is really powerful is that we don't even have to think about it. So I can go through my day-to-day -day life um, not thinking about racism. And that's one of the, the biggest benefits of white privilege is that I can choose not to think about it at all. And really, it's only when I make an active choice to engage in conversations about racism that I, that I have to. And that's just one of the, the benefits. And I had a girl say that in my class the other day, everybody's racist, and I said, but the way you are racist is not the way we all are racist. And that's why I brought we, up reverse racism. Yeah, but like, see, but that's what I said. We, people of color, have never been racist enough to dominate, colonize, rape, and pillage other countries. I agree. We don't have that type of racist power. We are the ones who are oppressed. So don't say everybody is racist because your racist power is not ours. No. And ours is, ours is internalized racism, like the whole, you know, light skin, dark skin for black people. That oh was, my God, that was that, developed, that's a huge one. We were talking yeah. about that today and, earlier. And that was developed black and slavery when if you were darker than a paper bag, you worked in the field. And if you were lighter, you were in the house. And as a result, people who worked in the house felt that they were better than people in the field because they at least didn't have to go hard and, and it's not, it's not even just with black people, it's with... Most countries, it's but you with see most, what I mean. With but, most but that was, but that was a white, that was a white idea created. Exactly. That's how no, the white, that's, that's how the slave master would do that. They'd hold the, the black guy up to the paper bag. Okay, you're in the field. You can be. You know what I mean. the different ways that immigration policy and the colonial project of Canada um, of being on colonized land um, work together and in complex and, and not always straightforward ways. But our immigration policy from its beginning was about bringing certain kinds of people to Canada to settle um, and to take over um, indigenous lands, but it was also uh, largely racist and was about bringing uh, white people, so people from China and India and other countries um, were barred from coming to Canada. And I think um, if we kind of fast forward and look at that today, we see that um, in both cases there's forms of discrimination both towards uh, newcomers from um, the Global South or racialized peoples uh, who come to Canada, as well as Indigenous First Nations people who live here. And I think solutions to that have to go hand in hand as well. We have to think about how we address both of those issues. Now, I used to be Islamophobe uh, because of the media portrayal uh, of things like that and uh, I really got changed when uh, the whole situation with ISIS happened. And I felt really impacted by it and it really affected me uh, emotionally and um, God really put on me to to help and to do what I can to help these people so and, and, but here in Canada so I decided to volunteer to help Im immigrants and refugees um, come to Canada. And uh, that's where CCIS comes in and that's, that's where I started volunteering. And um, so I help refugees and immigrants immigrate to Canada. And I said I wanted, you know, um, people from the Iraq and Syria area, so I, I, that's what I got. Um, the first person I volunteered, volunteered for was uh, Abdullah and he is uh, from Kuwait and he is Sunni Muslim. And I've never met somebody so nice in my life. The guy's, the guy's awesome. Like, he's just, just like normal. I'm a guy. You know? 
I, I personally would like to start seeing a true K to 12 program, kindergarten to grade 12 program, where we start int introducing our real history and, and what colonialism is and uh, what racism is. I'd like to see a stop racism campaign from kindergarten to grade 12. And I'd also like to see a stop gender violence campaign that starts from kindergarten to grade 12. I think these things will help uh, solve missing and murdered Indigenous women, will we'll stop some of the racism, and it's going to take generations of teaching this for, for children to outgrow their parents and grandparents who were taught um, incorrect tr uh, truths about us, uh, well, not truths, incorrect myths about us, um, and it's going to take generations. But, for example, my daughter, who is who's seven, so in grade two, uh, there are age-appropriate books about residential schools that don't go into the major, um, you know, sexual abuse that we endured or the, or the hard realities of what physical abuse was. But it introduced the concept of residential schools through a book like uh, Cookham's Red Shoes. So uh, if we can start that education component, that will help start the road of, of what the problem is here. You are nice people. You already open your country for... Uh all immigrants to come and share with you the future. So just give yourself the chance to come and meet them and try to um, try to, to fill the gaps between us and uh, because we, we are sharing we are sharing the community, we are sharing the love, we are sharing the challenge and we are looking for better future. So it's, uh, it will be nice that um, if we can create a better environment for all of us to get together and know, and I, I am sure I w we will have uh, so many benefits like from, from us together, um, rather than staying uh, apart. We just have to, 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 to learn from each other and make this place a better place for everybody. It doesn't matter which, where the person comes from, so long as we all work for the better future, for, for Canada and for where we come from. They have to tolerate it. But uh, I would say it's a long road to go. They should change from uh, tolerance to acceptance, not only acceptance. Their final stage is to recognize or to acknowledge the importance and the benefits of diversity. So my suggestion is for the human resources professionals, we have to take the lead uh, to encourage and promote diversity within the workplace. And the second thing is we have to gain the support and the sponsorship from the executive management and then from the top to the down of the companies all the employees should embrace diversity and inclusion so this is what we have to do if you don't acknowledge the importance and the benefits of diversity we do not have the promotion uh, motivation to work on this journey Maybe more uh, newer groups to Canada might not report as often. You know, there's, we get the sense sometimes that maybe some stuff is happening, like graffiti at a mosque, and we're just not aware of it. You know, it's not being reported to us, right? They may not think it's that big a deal. You know, maybe back home there's no such thing as hate crimes, right? <laughs> so they just paint over it. And, you know, the effect is still there on them, but they don't take that next step to report it. Like for females especially, like being able to keep your hair like all your eyebrow hair your upper lip hair you know all the hair around here is such like that's the most intimidating issue i feel for so many sikh women um but being in that community where it's promoted and there's nothing like if we don't set a lower standard it's something that can really inspire us and help us to raise to a higher standard and it shouldn't be something that we're like shying away from or we feel really like intimidated and feel like we're gonna miss out on opportunities or people are gonna view us in a certain way just because you have more hair than somebody else. Like it's really a confidence issue. Like if we're confident in who we are and like our skin, like these kinds of issues don't matter. It's your performance and the way that you act every day and your character that ultimately like speaks higher than your appearance. I was really lucky growing up because I grew up with a lot of positive stereotypes. I mean, Asians are supposed to be good at math, hardworking, good at kung fu, and 
become an engineer, doctor, or lawyer, and I lived up to all those expectations. Now, however, I'm a documentary filmmaker. I broke the mold. But it did take some work in overcoming the limitations of how I even saw myself, or how my parents saw me, or how society sees me. So I think it's just part of the maturing process. You grow up and you realize that you don't have to fit in this box. And maybe as a society, for us to mature, we have to start seeing people as more than just the specific roles or, or the stereotypes that we have about them. That human beings have a full range of possibilities and that we should allow every member of society to have those possibilities. So there's one thing that I have to mention and it's the overall racism towards Aboriginals, the Aboriginals of Canada. And in Calgary, it is the dominating force of racism. You can ask 90% of the people in the city and they will all, like as soon as you say native, they will all imagine this drunk, poor, homeless person just stumbling down the street. And what's really sad is I have to actually admit that I was one of those people because I wasn't truly educated about an Aboriginal person's history, their history with Canada, which was a very dark, untold history. And finally, because I don't know more and other groups are kind of popping up and saying, you know what, enough is enough. We need this to stop. Finally, we're starting to understand why they are the way that they are. You, you go from being racist to not racist. If you experience those experiences yourself and you, you feel like you need to make a change and you don't want to do what people are doing to you, you don't want to be part of that vicious cycle, that's how I feel like. I mean, I can only start with yeah. myself. That's how I look at it. Um, so it is something that we also have to teach our children uh, for our forthcoming generations that uh, so they are educated um, and they are more respectful to others. Um, so again, my message to everybody is let's, be, let's get united and face those problems and uh, uh, make sure that we do not be a bystander, we stand together. My role is to make you uncomfortable enough to change within yourself that I would want to be your friend. I don't have to tell you something that you should already know is wrong. I shouldn't have to tell you that telling somebody that they're a Jamaican princess when you have no idea what my ethnicity is, is wrong. Yeah, I, I should have to tell you that telling somebody that, um, oh, you're so sassy for a black girl, or you're so pretty or, for a black or, girl. Or like, or, like, or you'd come up to me, Mikhail, and say, oh, she's Beyonce, and you're, and you're Kelly Rowland, and we look nothing like them. It's just like skin them. tones, I you know? I, you, I shouldn't have to explain <laughs> that to you why that's wrong. But I'm telling you, that's the reason why. It I, happens, though. Yeah. Don't be surprised. And that's what, or people come up to you and be like, Wow, your hair's curly. You look like Michelle like, Obama. Wow. And it's like, you know, I'm just like, it's funny sometimes, but it's like, it's just really, it's it's funny because it's would so you, ignorant. It's it, exactly so. If someone ever, and that's another thing too. It's like, do I fight back and tell them you look like Hillary Clinton? Yeah. Or you know what I mean? And that's and that's what I'm saying. Like, what are you I feel like. To do? I mean, I think part of it is education. I think part of it is also action. Um, it's, it'd be great to see anti-racist organizations pop up here in agencies. Yeah. It'd be great to see public organizations have more of an anti-racist mandate. Uh, it'd be great to see, you know, uh, a city that's not so, um, so into punitive policing that looks at, you know, rehabilitative programs, have more proactive programs. It'd be great to see more affordable housing. It'd be great to see more policies that deal with homelessness because these are all things that actually help. Uh, with anti-racist work. There's the Spider-Man saying, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. We have great power right now, and it's um, white folks who've got to step up, got a responsibility to change things. If somebody's blatantly racist in this country, then they need to go to America. <laughs>